In this video, we're going to look at another way to calculate delta H, or heat of reaction, and we're going to do it with bond energies, also called bond enthalpies. So essentially, a bond energy or a bond enthalpy is just the amount of energy required to break a bond. Remember that breaking a bond actually requires energy. It's endothermic. Um, things are actually tend to be more stable when they are bonded to each other. They have lower potential energy, so it takes energy to break the bond. For shorthand, you'll see me writing D and the bond type in parentheses to represent the bond enthalpy, in this case, for the CLCL -CL bond. Um, so you might see me doing that in the video just for shorthand. That's a common notation in chemistry to show a bond enthalpy. And these are typically values that you can look up, whether it's in the textbook, you can look it up in a data in a table. If it's an AP question, often they're tabulated in a table for the question. So these are known values. If you remember, there's certain things, um, certain factors that affect how much energy is needed to break a bond. Um, so one of them was bond order, which is basically how many pairs of electrons are in the bond. So remember that as bond order increases, as you go from single to double to triple bond, the bond gets shorter and stronger. So this was a concept from chapter eight and nine, factors that affect bond length and therefore bond strength. Anytime you have a shorter bond, it's gonna be stronger. And anytime you have a longer bond, it's gonna be weaker. Now, if you look at the data below, here's a CC bond. It's a longer bond. And notice it has a smaller bond energy. As I increase the number of electrons in the bond, we say the bond order, um, the bond length is going down. There's a shorter distance between the two atoms. And the bond energy goes up. And that kind of makes sense because as you increase the electron density between the atoms, um, the nuclei are able to get closer together because you have more negative electrons that can shield some of that repulsion between the nuclei. What's another important factor that affects bond length and strength? If you remember from chapter eight and nine, the other factor is radius. The shorter or the smaller the radius, Again, the closer those nuclei can get to each other because you have less electron shells, um, and therefore the shorter the bond. And as I said, anytime you have a shorter bond, it's gonna be stronger. The bond energy is gonna go up. Again, notice the bond energies are positive values. It takes energy to break the bond. Let's just review this for a moment from chapter eight and nine. If you remember, since the AP loves diagrams, You'll remember this, um, this plot of energy um, versus bond length or versus distance between nuclei. So let's say this represents the bond energy of a CLCL bond. Um, this is where the atoms are infinitely far apart. There's no energy interactions between them. As they get closer and closer to each other, okay, um, it becomes more stable at a certain point where the bond is formed. And if they get too close, the repulsion's too great, no bond would be formed and the energy would shoot up. So if I wanna see what would this plot look like if it were a BRBR bond? So I want you to take a moment and think about that. Um, so what's the difference between BRBR versus CLCL? What's gonna affect the, the strength of that bond and the length of that bond. So BRBR, okay, they are going to have a larger radius than CLCL. Remember that radius is largest in the bottom left-hand corner of the periodic table. So as you go down the group, the atoms get bigger, which makes sense because you have more shells. Remember down a group is a distance argument um, or a shell argument. So BR has a larger radius. So, okay, my bond is gonna be longer and therefore weaker. So if I think about that, my bond length, so this represents the length, this x-axis here to this point, okay? Um, so I want that to be sh longer. I want, and, and I want the bond energy to be shorter. So a plot like this, where here's my bond length, it's now longer, here's my bond energy, it's now shorter. So I'm just tying this back to chapter eight and nine to explain why you're gonna see these certain bond energies that you do. Anytime you have a longer bond, again, it's gonna be a weaker bond. Okay, let's say now let's draw a diagram on top to represent the energy of an OO double bond. So again, let's think about it. The two factors that affect bond length and therefore bond strength would be radius, and type of bond. Well, OO has, okay, the oxygens have a smaller radius, 
they have less energy levels, less shells, so they're smaller. And there's a double bond, which would increase the density, which would allow those, a density of electrons, which would allow those two positive nu nuclei to get closer together. So in both instances, um, it's going to be a shorter and stronger bond between the two O's than between the CLs. So how would I want to show that on this diagram? I'd want the bond length, okay, to be shorter. So I want this moving to the left. And I want the bond energy to be larger. I'd want this moving down. So it would look something like this. Um, notice that the bond energy here dips into negative values because in this diagram, it shows the energy released when the bond is formed. And therefore, forming a bond is exothermic. That's why it's a negative energy value here. Um, whereas the tabulated values of bond energies, we always put that as the energy needed to break the bond. So it's the same value, but flipped to be a positive sign. So again, here showing smaller bond length, larger bond energy. Whenever the distance or the, short, the, the bond gets shorter, it gets stronger. So just kind of showing this, here's a bunch of bond energies in kilojoules per mole. This was taken from a data table in your textbook. Um, the first example that we did compared CLCL with BRBR. So notice that the CLCL bond has a higher bond energy. We said it was shorter and therefore it's going to be stronger because it has the smaller radii. Okay, and then in example two, um, we said the oxygen double-double bond is going to have a higher bond energy, and, when it, and it does. As shown here, it has a double bond, and it has a smaller radius. And if you look down here again, notice anytime these, these multiple bonds have a lot, on average, a lot higher bond energy than the single bonds. But it does also depend on radius. So... Again, average bond enthalpies are positive because breaking is an endothermic process. The greater the bond en enthalpy, the stronger the bond. And a molecule with weaker bonds is more likely to undergo chemical changes than a molecule with stronger bonds because it's going to be easier to break those bonds. It's going to require less energy to start that reaction to break those bonds and typically have a lower activation energy. Um, a couple of different types of reactions. Sometimes you want to kind of check your sign of delta H, so you should know which kind of processes are endo and which are exothermic. Breaking a bond, we said, is always endothermic. It takes energy to break a bond. And I know sometimes coming from bio, some people get that a little mixed up. They think, oh, bonds hold potential energy, and they do. Um, but actually, a bond has less energy, um, it's more stable, it has lower potential energy than the separated atoms. Forming a bond is exothermic, it releases energy, it becomes more stable when these things are bonded together, and that's why these a lot of these active metals and active nonmetals are found in nature bonded together, um, or in compounds, or in molecules. Um, the delta H of the reaction overall is going to depend on how many bonds are broken versus how many bonds are formed. So if you have more bonds and stronger bonds being formed, overall it's going to be exothermic and release energy. And vice versa, if you have more bonds or stronger bonds being broken, it's going to overall be endothermic because most reactions are a combination of breaking and forming. Now, if we look at different types of reactions like synthesis or combination, which is the same thing where you have one product, typically, not always, but usually they're exothermic. Why? Because for the most part, they're going to have bonds being formed. You're taking a lot of the times their constituent elements and putting them together into one compound. So overall, you're typically forming more bonds than you're breaking. This isn't always the case because sometimes you have diatomic molecules like your Hofbrinkel, or sometimes you might even have like a network covalent in there like carbon. So it does depend um, on what's there. But overall, they're typically exothermic. And decomposition, which is the opposite of combination or synthesis are usually endothermic because for the most part you're usually breaking more bonds than you're forming because you have one product that you're breaking down or decomposing often into constituent elements. Um, again, this is not always the case. It really does depend on how many bonds are broken and formed. Combustion reactions are always exothermic. If you do out the work for the, the bonds that are broken versus formed, you're going to see that they're always going to release um, release energy and that's why combustion reactions are often used like to power your car or to power different things. Neutralizations are also always exothermic of a strong acid with a strong base. They release energy and when we get to acid and base reactions a lot of times you might even feel the container getting hot because they're releasing energy. And this is also why if you get like an acid or a base on your skin we don't want to perform a neutralization on your body to get rid of the acid or base. That's why we say oh if you get acid on your hand rinse with water because if you put if you carry out a neutralization on your skin it's going to burn you because it's exothermic 
Okay, so as I said, another way to estimate delta H is using the bond energies. Um, so you can calculate the sum of the bonds um, broken, the enthalpies of the bonds broken, and subtract out the enthalpies of the bonds formed. This is, a, this is an equation that's not on your formula sheet, so it's something that you have to memorize. Um, so why is it broken minus formed? Because the, the, the bond energies that are tabulated are positive values. They're showing the energies of bonds broken. So I want to keep all of those ener uh, enthalpies positive for those that are broken. And for those formed, I'm essentially, by subtracting the ones that are formed, it's like I'm flipping the sign to be negative because those bonds are formed, it's exothermic, those energies would be negative values. So you don't actually have to go through and flip the values as long as you remember that you're doing the sum of the bonds broken minus the sum of the bonds formed. Now what gets people is that people usually think of delta H change, right, when you see delta, as final minus initial. You're getting the bonds broken by looking at your reactants, and you're getting the bonds formed by looking at your products. So in a way, it's almost like reactants minus products, which you're not used to. So that's why you really have to be comfortable with this equation, and most people accidentally flip it because it's not in your formula sheet. So a reaction will be overall endothermic if the energy required is greater than the energy released. Essentially, more or stronger bonds are broken than formed. And a reaction will be exothermic if the energy released is greater than the energy required. Or essentially, when more or stronger bonds are formed than are broken. Take a moment to write that in. Okay, so again, here's my chart of the bond energies. We're going to use this in our next problem. In the textbook, you might have to look these up in a chart. And for textbook problems, any AP or exam question would have these embedded in the problem statement. So I want you to take a moment and try this example. Estimate the delta H for this reaction, okay, using the bond enthalpies on the previous slide. If you want to pause the video, give it a shot. If you want to go back for a moment to look at that slide, go ahead. Okay, so the thing that you always want to do that I find helpful, for here I kind of drew out the diagrams. So if you have a chemical reaction, it's helpful to draw out the Lewis structure so you can actually visually see what's being broken and what's being formed. So in CH4, okay, it's kind of, if I look at the reactant to product, CH4 is kind of turning into CH3Cl. So three of the CH bonds are not being broken or formed. They're not being touched. So I really don't have to include them in my calculation. Some people will break up every single bond and form every single bond and you will get the same answer. But I tend to simplify this and say, okay, are there any bonds that aren't changing at all? I don't have to account for them. Why do I do that? Because if there's if this is on a multiple choice for the AP, you might not have a calculator and simplifying what numbers are going into your calculation will always be helpful. Okay, so I'm going to consider what's being broken as one CH because the CH is being replaced by a CCL. Okay, and then the CLCL bond is also going to be broken because notice that the CLs are going to different places. So what's broken is one CH bond and one CLCL bond. Well, what's being formed, one CCL bond and one HCL bond. Okay, so... If I'm doing out my calculation, it's the sum of the bonds broken minus the sum of the bonds formed. And remember this D with the bond in parentheses just stands for bond enthalpy. So if I go back to the chart and actually look up values and plug them in, again, remember the chart is all positive values because those are energies being um, for the bond to be broken. That's why I'm subtracting out the bonds that are formed. So when I do this, I get an overall negative number, 104 kilojoules. As I had said before, if you were instead to go back and do um, four CH bonds broken and three CH bonds formed in one CCL, um, you will end up getting the same answer. Um, so you can completely break everything down and completely build everything up, but again, that's going to take more time and more of a calculation.
So notes, tips for bond enthalpy problems. Memorize the equation broken minus formed. Um, or if you don't like broken minus formed, you can just flip the sign of all the bonds that are formed because they would be exothermic rather than endothermic. Um, however, I find it more helpful to just keep them all positive and do broken minus formed. Draw out the structures to visually see bonds that are being broken or formed. Also make sure to count the correct number. So for instance, if there was a two, as a coefficient in front of Cl, C, uh, Cl2, that means that there'd be two ClCls and there might be two ClCl bonds broken. Um, so consider the coefficients because they may affect the number of bonds. And if changing the type of bond, if on one side it's a single bond, let's say between two Cs, and on the right hand side it's a double bond, consider the single bond broken and the double formed. Okay, so because they would have different bond energies and you can't just get the difference between them. Um, and remember, sometimes the problem might give you the delta H and ask you to solve for a missing bond enthalpy. I've seen that a lot. So you'll have what's on the left-hand side and be solving for a missing bond enthalpy. Just like in those heats of formation problems where sometimes they give you the delta H and ask you to solve for a missing heat of formation. Okay, take a moment and try this problem. You'll have to go back to that chart to see the bond enthalpies. Okay, so again, as I said, I find it helpful to draw it out. So here's N2H4. Each of these ends are trigonal pyramidal. They'd have a lone pair on top and a single bond between the ends. N2 has a triple bond and there's two H, um, H2s. So remember that two is going to be important for there's two HH bonds formed. So what's broken? Notice that all the H's come off of the ends. So there's four NH bonds that are broken. Um, the, the bond between the two ends is changing from a single to a triple, so I'm going to consider that there's an NN single bond being broken. If you're changing the type, and I remind you at the bottom, consider the first type broken and the second type formed. Otherwise, you're not going to get the correct answer. There's an NN triple bond formed, and there's two HH bonds formed. So don't forget that coefficient can be important, and people sometimes forget about that, especially if you're drawing it. You might want to remind yourself and put that coefficient in front. So remember, to get delta H, if you're using bond enthalpies, it's not final minus initial. It's not products minus reactants. It's actually bonds broken minus bonds formed. And again, a lot of people forget that because to get the broken bonds, you're looking at the reactant side. Okay, so if I total this up, okay, here's all my bonds broken minus my bonds formed. Don't forget to multiply by the coefficients here in front because we said there's four NH bonds broken, there's two HH bonds formed, and I get this is overall exothermic and it's negative 86 kilojoules. Remember that instead of giving of, of, give, of finding delta H, they might give you delta H, they might give you what's on the left-hand side here in the problem statement, and you might be solving for a missing bond enthalpy.